Good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Hey, you have reached uh, the Ian DuBay Show, and today I have the slippery Dexter McLeod, the world's most busiest man, the hardest working man in track and field. Dexter, how you doing? I'm doing just fine. How are you? Man, I'm wonderful. I, if I was any better, I'd explode, and they'd charge you with a, a weapons of mass destruction charge. Uh, you paint a vivid picture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, you know it, Dexter. Hey, okay. you, you got to have some comedy. So, Dexter, you finally ha hung up the spikes. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, well, um, I have not filled out any retirement papers, but yes, that is uh, true. I'm no longer an active athlete. I've um, I'm dedicated myself to the, I guess, for lack of a better term, the administrative side of track and field. So, what does the administrative side of track and field really mean? Uh, for me, um, I um, I work with uh, USA Track and Field. Um, I'm an officer with the Athletes Advisory Committee, and our um, our organization is responsible for honestly looking out for the uh, welfare of uh, all of our elite and professional athletes, um, not just those that make um, international teams like the Olympic teams and World Championships, um, but all the way down to the grassroots. Um, every athlete within USA Track and Field, the they obviously have certain rights within this organization, and we protect those rights. And in, and in part of those that protection, we also give them a lot of advice and consultation um, with regard to contract, agents, how to find meets, marketing, the, the entire um, scale with regard to uh, an athlete uh, making money in this sport. So let, let's do a little dial back. Let's, let's get you familiar or let's get the audience familiar with who you are. So you're from Florida, is that correct? Originally, yes, I am from Florida. Okay. And so you started track when? High school, college, or how's that story? Um, I started my junior year in high school uh, running the hurdles. Um, I obviously, I ran the two years, remaining years in high school, went on to college, Florida State University, and uh, took my professional step immediately after that, trying to make an Olympic team. Uh, Qualified for two trials, didn't make any. So uh, that's the downside. The, the upside is, uh, you know, I went around the world traveling, uh, did a lot of things that I normally wouldn't have done if I had not been involved with track and field. Um, and in the interim, I ended up winning uh, four world titles for indoor world championships. So it's not a completely uh, down story. Well, okay, we're going to dial back. So here you are. You've, you've, you've had a collegiate career. Were you NCAA All-American when you were at Florida State? Uh, what what uh, yes. was your record there? Uh, I used to have the, uh, what do you call it, the uh, school record until I think Arthur Blake broke it in 1988. Um, I ran, I believe, in college 1353, something along those lines, but he ran 13-4. Uh, but I haven't dwelled on that in a long time. But, um, yes, I was an NCAA All-American. Um, when I was running, this tells a, bit of, a little bit about how old I am. We were still in the Metro Conference, not AAC. I'm sorry, ACC. So I am the uh, last four-time undefeated uh, champion within the Metro Conference. So uh, that's pretty much the – I can't – honestly, it's so far back, it's kind of a blur for me, but – I had a pretty good time in college. Now, when you were running in college, who were the, the, the household names? Who were the big dogs in, in track and field in your sport, in your event? Oh, well, in my event, I think everybody would recognize Ronaldo Nehemiah. He's, without doubt, probably one of the uh, premier hurdlers of, of all times. And then, of course, it was Greg Foster. And um, honestly, uh, I ran against guys who were like uh, um, – Hmm. Willie Galt, I think everybody would recognize him, a former player with the Chicago Bears. He ran for um, Tennessee. And even though he was SEC and I was in Metro, we still crossed each other's paths. Chris Pearson, who was a teammate of Ronaldo Nehemiah. Uh, so those people um, I ran against um, being, I'm sorry, week in and week out. So compared to now versus then, what metamorphosis has happened in hurdling? Was it the density um, of uh, the competition? Where you know, was it day in, week in, week out? It was anybody's race, or was there someone that dominant? 
Well, honestly, I think, um, and this is only me saying this, I, I have had these conversations with other hurdlers, and so I, I'm going to sound like an old-timer, but back in the day, hurdlers actually, uh, we wanted to run every weekend, and we didn't care who was in the race. We actually thought that it was good for the sport um, to beat each other up. Um, and it's not just hurdles, but I see that now in, in other um, events. Athletes, and I wouldn't say they avoid each other, but they don't run against each other um, as actively and as often. And I understand why. One, because there's more money involved. So if Usain Bolt ran every weekend, then the product gets diluted. So I, I certainly understand why people don't run as much. But that's one of the biggest changes that I see is that um, athletes are a lot more selective about when they run in and out of college. Would you say so there is really no active rivalry? Is that kind of the – is that where the, the turn happened in track and field where if, if I go and watch the NBA, I know there's a natural rivalry between the Knicks and the Celtics, you know, the Lakers and the Celtics. You know, there's those natural rivalries uh, inherent, Florida State, Florida. So track and field is now not engaged anymore in active rivalries like Foster versus Nehemiah. I mean, I realize that there's a lot more money in, in, um, involved, but where is it now that week in and week out, as, as every athlete is taught or everybody, every athlete has that intrinsic desire to be number one? So now it's number one with... Um, you know, what do you want to call it? Well, it's number one with some type of uh, category. Well, honestly, um, I haven't seen a, a good old-fashioned rivalry. When I say a rivalry where one athlete, I wouldn't say hate each other, but they, they're they not necessarily that friendly towards each other. I haven't seen that in a long time, probably since maybe even the Michael Johnson era is probably the last time that I can think of it. Um, I would have said LaShawn... Merritt and Jeremy Warner, but I don't know that they have a feeling one way or the other. I just know that those are the two high pro, highest profile athletes that I think that I've seen run against each other in a while. But is it a rivalry? Do they have some type of antipathy towards each other? I, honestly, I can't say. But I do know, for example, when we when we ran, uh, for example, and I forgot to mention um, certainly Roger Kingdom. Um, while we weren't unfriendly towards each other, there wasn't a whole bunch of uh, buddy, buddy, hey, how are you doing going on? We knew that we wanted to beat this guy, and we sort of felt like we had to run with a chip on our shoulder. And I'm not saying like it's a bad thing, but I feel like the athletes today, it's not so much I want to be number one, but I want to make this money. And I'm certainly all about making the money for the athlete, but I think the edge has come, come off just a little bit because – I see a lot of guys hands clapping and saying, hey, how are you doing? What's going on with you? And there's certainly nothing wrong with that. But then it's, in my mind, it's pretty hard for me to get up and do as hard as I can against someone who's a friend. Now, that's just the competitor in me. A lot of people aren't like that. And don't, and don't get me wrong, when I, when I ran track, it wasn't as if I hated these athletes. It was just for that two-hour stretch from the time I warmed up until the time I ran, there was nobody that I wanted to talk to. I didn't want to be around my family. But as soon as I crossed the finish line, hey, I'm fine with it. So maybe it, may, it might just be a reflection on me, but that's just my feeling about it. Now, okay, you, you say that there's no real inherent rivalries. It's buddy. It's all about the money. But do you think, and you, you said it, has that really diluted the product? Because, you know, the media, once you're in the media, there's a story. So what's the storyline if, uh, gosh, you're, you're my friend, there's no inherent rivalry there? What, how does that become appealing to a, a regular consumer that says, you know what, this, this is kind of boring. Nobody, nobody has, you know, there's no protagonist and antagonist. Any book that I read has a protagonist. It has an antagonist. It has a storyline. All the media uh, looks for a story. You know, Usain Bolt, Tyson Gay, Tyson Gay, Justin Gatlin, uh, Carmelita Jeter, and Veronica Campbell, Lolo Jones, Kelly Wills, Dawn Harper. You know, even if there isn't anything there, they're going to find something there because obviously they're trying to build an audience. 
So, you know, they're going to they're gonna find the least, even what I refer to as a minute detail, it'll, it'll become something, um, especially around Olympics time. And all the better if the athlete see, you know, sees it as an opportunity. And I, honestly, I don't, I don't put it above anyone. <clears throat> I kind of think that sometimes one athlete may talk to another and say, hey, you know what? We can get, we can get a lot more marketability out of this if people think that we don't like each other because we run against each other all the time. And hey, whatever works, because in the end, this is a, this is a professional sport and it's also entertaining. Exactly. And, and, you know, we as the regular consumer want to be entertained. I mean, I remember the great um, debate when Dennis Mitchell and, and his green machine persona started challenging King Carl and started to try to uh, change the establishment. And it made good TV fodder. It made good entertainment. It made uh, people root for one person versus the other. Uh, it, you know, you talked about Michael Johnson. You talked about... Jeremy Warner and LaShawn Merritt because there was that rivalry there. That's something that was always talked about. And it just seems like that's a missing ingredient in making our sport really the forefront of uh, athletics. And, and if you remember way back in the day, remember when USA versus Russia where USA was the protagonist and Russia was the antagonist, and you had that storyline of the illicit drugs. Now, the illicit drugs is the first storyline, and then the hmm afterwards. Is this person on it, or are they not on it when they run fast? And that's kind of a, I, I think it's a, uh, a sad state of affairs for our sport. So now, let, let's move forward here. Um, you're now involved heavily in AAC. Your your role is secretary. What does that role encompass? Well, um, I always try to impress upon people that being the secretary doesn't mean that I just take minutes. I am um, I work closely with John Drummond, who is the chair of um, Athletes Advisory. And honestly, what we do is we take care of the day-to-day affairs, as I said, of being the stewards of the... Uh, of uh, the athletes' um, um, rights, Take just honestly, anything that some um, athletes involved. Uh, USA Track and Field uses us as a liaison to the athletes. We um, we communicate the interests of the athletes to USA Track and Field with regard to um, how our international teams are selected, how the national team staff, including medical staff, is selected. Um, even things, even down to something uh, something as minute as. We want a pizza hut, and I'm just exaggerating to make a point, when we go to, go to Moscow because we don't like the foods. So we, um, honestly, we're like the godfathers for the, for, the, uh, for the athletes, for the international teams. So part of what I do is on a day-to-day basis is I'm always, always talking to someone in USA Track and Field, whether it's um, uh, Bika Suggs, who's responsible for the um, – Funding, um, Aaron uh, McGuire, who does international teams, Sandy Snow, who's a high performance manager. It goes on and on. And wh- whatever the detail or the situation is at the time, um, JD and I, I'm sorry, John Drummond and I, as well as um, Alan Johnson, who's the vice chair, we deal with those issues as they come up. We have uh, weekly high performance calls with Benita Fitzgerald, who's the chief of high performance. Um, at USA Track and Field with regard to the high performance plan, funding for athletes, um, putting on domestic meets, international meets, um, how we will spend our money because athletes advisor, we have a, a budget, uh, that we use for the athletes. So, you know, in, on any given day, you can call me and there's a different fire going on. Now, you talk about fires, all right. So, it's fires amongst the athletes, I'll assume. Or yes. is it fires amongst the the national governing body, the way it it's, applies to athletics? It's a fire wherever, wherever a fire can break out. For example, um, as you said, outside of athletics, um, I deal with uh, the governance manual and bylaws with regard to our rights. I sometimes, um, uh, we have a, uh, USA Track and Field has a governance manual, like any other organization, that they use to um, govern uh, their day-to-day affairs. So, so these bylaws get amended every two years or can be. So there are times when we feel it's necessary to uh, uh, put in a, 
um, an amendment change, a request amendment change, because we think that it adversely affects uh, an athlete's rights. Um, with, in, in the same vein, there's also a rules handbook that's um, modified every uh, every two years. So, for example, uh, two years ago we had the um, had issues with regard to the no false start rule, and, and at the same time we have to be in, um, uh, in alignment with the IAAF as well as the IOC. So, I have to keep an eye on things on, on the international scene as, as with regard to how they affect our athletes, and vice versa. So. I have to have many hats at times. Um, I have gone to the board with regard to marketing ideas, with regard to marketing our athletes, how they can steer more money toward our athletes because um, while this is a professional sport, it's a, for lack of a better term, a poor professional sport when compared to the NBA or the, or the NFL. So part, a large part of what we do is we're always trying to figure out how to increase the marketability of our athletes. We take our higher tier athletes like Sion Rippers Ross or Allison Felix, and of course everyone sees them, everyone knows them, the media loves them. So we try to find out ways to make other athletes just as marketable as those athletes. So uh, again, back to my particular role, my role is um, honestly to support the athletes, to support the other officers. We have John Thurman who's the chair, Alan Johnson is the vice chair, um, we have Michelle Lewis, who is a USOC AAC uh, representative, as well as John Nunn, and we have Leslie Higgins, who is our treasurer. So we have an organization within the organization that deals with just, just taking care of our athletes. And when I say taking care, it's not as if these athletes are children. Uh, obviously, they are professional athletes. They are an adult. But we work just like the player, the NFL Players Association with the, the pro football players or the NBA um, players a union. So, all right. So you're kind of the you are the advocate for the athletes. Now you talked about a lot of athletes. You talked about the big name athletes. Now, what is it that you're doing for the up and coming? So you know the NFL has this rookie camp, rookie symposium. They they bring in the athletes. They they go over this rookie symposium. You use. Uh, couple former football players. Michael Irvin has been one of the uh, spokesmen for the NFL that, you know, st- talks with the rookies. Now, is that something that happens as the athletes transition from the NCAA setting or NAIA setting and then transition into a professional um, athletic oh, yeah. career? Uh, we, have the, we have something um – um, that closely follows that um, that paradigm. We refer to our, our rookies, if you call it that, as um, our immediate post-collegiate athletes. Um, our definition of a rookie is in an ath- any athlete who's within two years of their last season of collegiate eligibility. And, yes, we, uh, we have standards. And a- any athlete who has run in a standard, and I-, I can get to that in a moment, any athlete who is running a state standard, we invite them to um, any event uh, that we have. And the biggest event that we have is at the annual meeting. We have a rookie symposium um, where we teach our athletes what it means to be a professional athlete, how to find agents or how to let agents find you, what it means, what it means to run in Europe versus the United States, what it means to make an international team. Things of that nature. Everything that an athlete would need to know, we cover in the rookie, in the rookie symposium. And in addition to that, um, after after every international um, meet, for example, the Big Three, the World Championships, Pan American Games, or the Olympic Trials. I'm sorry, all the Olympic Games. We, the athletes advisory, we put on what's referred to as a, an athlete retreat, sometime between October and December, where we get everybody in that team, and we will take them somewhere. Just pick a city. We, we, we vote on it. Now, obviously, we figure out if it makes good financial sense. And we have more um, uh, educational courses, uh, more advice. We have people like Carl Lewis, Maurice Green, other athletes from the, diff- from the previous era come in and speak to them about being professional athletes. So, yes, we, um, we have covered that from A to Z. We have obviously doing not just athletes who are running during the current era, but we also have the USA Track and Field Alumni Association. So from the cradle to the grave, if you will, we take care of our athletes from the time they get out of college 
to the time they decide they're not going to run anymore. And this is the last time on the podium. So now here I am. I, I, I finished my collegiate athletic career. What is the determining factor? Or what decisions go into play um, that say I can make it at the next level? What would you advise me as the advocate for track and field if I decided, hey, I've had a pretty good collegiate career. Is, is it in my cards to move on and try to be an international or a professional athlete? Uh, well, honestly, um, it's a lot more scientific than you would think. Um, for example, the NBA and the NFL, um, obviously, an athlete plays these, these sports, and they just decide that, hey, I want to be a pro. And obviously, an agent has talked to them, I believe, or maybe their coaches talked to them and said, hey, I think you have a chance at the next level. So they declare themselves for the draft. And then, obviously, the team likes them, thinks they're good enough, and they've gone through these, these combines or these evaluations. A team says, hey, I, I think this guy can play the next level of this girl, and I will draft him to play on my team. However, within USA Track and Field, the system is slightly different. We don't have a draft. Um, but we do know with a certain degree of, um, with some degree of certainty, if an athlete can compete at the next level. We know this because we have some historical data. For example, we believe that most athletes who are very good at the world junior level will probably be able to excel in, um, if they have not gotten into college yet at the NCAA level as well as the Olympic level. So we, we have tracked athletes. We have, I would say, 10 years worth of data. And so we have... Uh, and when you say who, can you clarify who is we? We, I would say USA Track and Field, specifically Duffy Mahoney, who um, handles uh, high-performance um, evaluations for USA Track and Field. So, and, and honestly, this is driven by um, USOC funds USA Track and Field um, let's get down to it. Medals translates and translates into money. So USO, the U.S. Olympic Committee gives USA Track and Field a certain amount of money. Let's uh, let's pick a number out of the air. Let's say two million dollars. And for two million dollars, USA Track and Field has to um, create a high performance plan on how to spend those funds. So we can't just take two million dollars because although that sounds like a lot of money to the average person. If you're splitting that between 100, maybe 200 athletes, it doesn't go that far. So we have to get the biggest bang for our buck and spend our money uh, as judiciously as possible. So we will evaluate each athlete and we will say, is this an athlete that we think will make a team and not only make a team, but will win medals for us? And not only will they win medals for us, will they have longevity in the sport? So we, uh, we meaning USA Track and Field, specifically Duffy Mahoney, has this data, and he says, uh, I will look at, and I'll pick on Allison Felix, for example. Allison Felix, from the time I believe she was in the eighth grade, she always excelled. So obviously not only college recruiters were looking at her, but USC Track and Field was looking at her. And at some point, she was so good that someone said, you know what, we believe that you can turn pro right now, even before you go to college. So she made the decision, her and her, her parents, parents for support group and said, hey, Allison will turn pro right now because she is just that good and her window opportunity is now. So USA Track and Field, believe me, I believe played a part in that um, decision. Not necessarily that they spoke with Allison because they they can't because of NCAA um, by, uh, regulations. But I believe they said if Allison makes that team or if Allison turns pro, this is someone that we can help um, get to the next level. And, and that help could be anything from give, um, giving her advice on where to find agents. This is where the athlete's advisor comes in. Or just honestly just putting her in track meets, exposing her to world-class competition to see how she would react. And obviously she reacted and she excelled. So that's an ongoing exercise for Duffy Mahoney at USA Track and Field. So and, Duffy, uh, so Benita, Benita Fitzgerald's high-performance um, department in general. So Duffy and Benita 
and maybe whatever resource they're using, they're evaluating the next up and coming. So in, like any other good organization, you're looking for the next Allison Felix. You're looking for the next uh, Tyson Gay because obviously they are now getting up there in their athletic careers. And, and historically, two Olympic Games is pretty much the most for most people um, or Olympic athletes. So now um, you've got... Uh, the championships that are coming up sometime in June and middle June, middle to late June. So who are June the athletes 20th. to look out for? Who are we looking at? Who's looking good at this point? Um, at this point, as of today, I'd say, um, honestly, if you're involved with track and field, these names won't be unfamiliar to you, but people like Aries Merritt, uh, Carmelita Jeter, uh, Allison Felix, Sonia Richards-Ross, Tyson Gay, Justin Gatlin. Um, these are people who have made teams before, and we believe that they're best bet to make a team again. However, there are also a, a lot of athletes who you may not, have, may not have heard of if you're not fully invested in track and field, but people like myself, we're track junkies, we do know who they are, and they're relatively young. But, for example, Queen Harrison, um, Lolo Jones is a, is a household name right now. Um, mm, Oh, I I'm drawing a blank. I can't believe this. But, Maurice um, Mitchell. Mar you're right. Montiel Mitchell. Maurice. Um, so the list goes on. But, the, but then there are people, like, like I said, there's, a, there's 115 to 130 athletes. So, you know, there are going to be a lot of old people, relatively speaking, but there are going to be some surprises. So, you know, that's the, that's the good part about going to um, track meets because, you know, I think the average person says it's a track meet, it's a race, but it, there's always the story within the story. So now if you were a prognosticator looking into this globe, uh, crystal ball, who do you predict is going to have a breakout season this year? So we're going to make who you does, Jimmy the Greek. Hmm. Uh, honestly, uh, there are a lot of good hurdlers out there, and, but I think Queen Harrison is going to shake up the world. Kelly Wells is going to see me in her fake place um, at the, at, on the podium. She's already gotten the bronze medal at, at the last um, um, international, at, at the, um, sorry, the, the Olympic Games. So people like that who are on the cusp, um, they're just going to make another leap, I think. Kathy Beringer, uh, she got a bronze medal in the high jump. And this girl is, I believe, just a junior in college now. Uh, I'm predicting big things. But at the same time, let's not forget, and I don't want to call her the old lady, but Shantae Lowe always seems to come out um, at, at, at the at championship time and, and, and perform her best. Well, so I know I, Shantae I will probably thing. won't be uh, competing this year because she's uh, having another baby. So she won't be wow. competing. Okay, um, so so much for that prognostication. Yeah, so if if that happens, you know that I mean I I got to give her to everything in the world. She can jump with baby. That would be rough. But you know the wow. good thing about her now is she's actually uh, coaching at uh, Grayson, and it was great watching her at the high school track and field championships this year and um, mm -hmm. up in Jefferson. Now, on the same prognostication, who do you think is going to? On the contrary, who's who's on, who's on the watch list? Who's who's on the precipice of retirement? You know, who's Father Time calling their name in your in your view? Well, Swanee, you mentioned that I live here in Atlanta, Georgia, and I think it's two Atlanta athletes that um, one has already declared that um, this might be his Olympic last Olympics, and that'll be Terrence Trammell and his uh, teammate Angelo Taylor. Um, Angelo hasn't said anything about retiring. But there are a lot of guys who are running fast, and I just feel like there's something else uh, Angel's ready to do. He's done everything that he can do, uh, I believe, or, or he wants to do in USA Track and Field. So um, Terrence had already had, owns um, several businesses. So, you know, and I'm not saying the hunger isn't there, the fire isn't there, but he's already looking at, um, to, you know, uh, open up his um, his horizons in other areas. And I think uh, he and Angelo, they came in together, and I think they may want to go out together. And I think it will be even cooler if they go out on top. So, obviously, Father Time plays. Now, as an athlete who just recently retired, what was the determining factor? What said, you know what, I'm hanging it up? 
What what went through your mind when you made that decision? Uh, well, a couple of things. One one thing that I always I, I've always told people is, at least for track and field athletics, I don't think our athletes lose the ability to run. Um, clearly, young athletes will probably press them more, but I think part of it is athletes just get tired of sitting in the ice tub. It's you know it's if you want to call it father time, it's just you know running track, practicing every day is a grind. Um, and sometimes when you grind every day, then you find yourself uh, facing injuries every, um, more often. I myself, I was looking to respect, I didn't have a lot of injuries, so that didn't play as much of a factor in, in my case. Um, after winning, um, in my case, uh, four world titles, I just I just didn't feel like there was anything else that I I needed to prove, and I wanted to go out on top. I didn't want to be like an old boxer and get knocked out. So you were protecting your uh, your image, your brand, as you as you want to call it. Sure. <laughs> I, I, when when people Google me, I want them to Google and say, "Hey, he ran and then he ended like he wanted to," much like Barry Sanders. Instead of uh, he was a punch drunk hurdler that uh, at the end of his career lost more than he won. As we always say on the on the bus wherever we're coming from a track meet, I didn't want to be the old man at the club. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know about that because I see a lot of old men at the club when I um, go watch some of these track meets. I mean, at Penn Relays, I've seen guys out there 100 years old running the uh, 100. So when I get home back on Monday and I hear anybody gripe about, man, I'm sore, I'm tired, I said, man, I just watch a 100-year-old guy run the 100 uh, at Penn Relays. You have nothing to claim uh, to cry about. So it's always fun. Dexter, thank you very much. You're off the hot seat. We appreciate your uh, time. 30 minutes goes by incredibly fast, and uh, I think we can always talk about track and field day in and day out and um, continue to do the great things that you're doing at the national level and obviously make sure that you look out for the, the people in Georgia because I think we just reload. And it seems like there's always a, a athlete coming up in the pipe. I mean, I look at Kendall Williams in about four years. I think she'll make a run. She ran 13-2 at the girls' high school state meet by herself. And she's been on some international teams. And she is not overtrained at this point, from my opinion, in talking with her father. Cool. Well, I'd like, I like to say one thing in parting. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for having me on. But finally... I want everybody to check us out this summer when the world's number one team, uh, USA, will go out to Russia and we will put it down, as we say, uh, out on the track. Any predictions, any world records? We're going to put you on, Jimmy the Greek. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have no doubt that um, our 4 by one the one that's always, always the focus of everyone's attention, whether we're going to, A, make it around the track, but our girls just broke a world record. And honestly, um, I think there's room for another hundredth, maybe two hundredths of a second there. And I've, I've heard Ryan and, and, and Justin talk about, hey, we got to uh, go and reclaim ours as well because I think everyone thinks that um, the Jamaicans have sort of uh, pushed us aside. Um, but let's be clear. There's no one better than USA track and field. And you've heard it right here on the Ian Dubay Show. Dexter, have a great day. Thank you very much.